So you can do this workshop together. Here we go. So I'm placing my hands in my heart, taking in that deep breath of love and gratitude. So grateful for this opportunity to come together to be the two or more who are gathered in the name and the nature of love. Grateful to know that we are dedicated and devoted to being a healing presence in this world and shining the light on any blocks to love, knowing that they are healed back to the root source in all dimensions of time and space. So grateful to be here with these beautiful souls, grateful for all those that are here now and all who will listen later. And we're so very grateful to have all of our teachers, including our families and friends and all those we meet throughout our day and all those in the heavenly realms, our elder brothers and sisters, ascended masters, archangels, angels, and saints. We ask that they join us now, surrounding and supporting us, leading and guiding us through this beautiful conversation and throughout the rest of our days. And we're grateful that we get to share the benefits of our own healing and expansion with everyone because we are one with them. In grace and deep abiding gratitude, we let it be. And so it is. Amen. Good to see you all. So we're in chapter four, section three and four, Oops. love without conflict. And th this need not be, <laughs> yeah. Would anyone like to begin our sharing? Hi, everyone. Hi, Leslie. <sighs> Taking a deep breath in my, my busy morning. <laughs> well, I'll start. I thought both of these sections were pretty good. I will start in section three, Love Without Conflict. And paragraph one, it's so interesting that I think every single paragraph, the first sentence is always the most powerful. It's like I can go through this whole book and just read the first sentence and I'd be like, have a lot to contemplate. But I loved how it said, the reason it is hard to understand what the kingdom is within means is because the ego cannot understand it. I thought that is very interesting. No wonder it's so hard to understand if the ego can't understand it. And then section four just says the kingdom of heaven is you. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> and then paragraph three, sentence two, the ego arose from the separation and its continued existence depends on your believing in separation. So if we don't believe in separation, then I guess the ego goes away, right? Well, that sounds so easy. Why can't we just do it? Exactly. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it would be so simple. It really does. <laughs> and, so simple. Yeah. It is simple. It's just um, we've been living with these egos for however many years we've been on this planet. And so we're used to thinking with them, I guess. Um, and I think because the ego uses the body it makes separation seem so plausible. How yeah. do you mean we're all one? You're a body, I'm a body, he's a body, she's a body, so we're separate. But right. until you get it, and I mean, I do get it that we're all one, but sometimes I don't get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's very interesting. Um, and then just to finish up here, sentence six, still paragraph three. Against the sense of temporary existence, spirit offers you the knowledge of permanence and unshakable being. You who identify with your ego cannot believe God loves you. And then paragraph nine, sentence two, God has given you everything. This is one fact 
this one fact means the ego does not exist and makes it profoundly afraid. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that all that was very interesting talking about the ego. And again, it's nothing new to any of us, but it's always a good thing to read. Yeah. And it helps me to understand in reading that why sometimes there is so much resistance, you know, so much resistance to um, partnering up and reaching out with prayer, so much resistance to sitting down and doing my meditation, you know, so much resistance to doing all of my spiritual work because the ego's like, no, you know, kicking and screaming the whole way. Um, because it feels like death to the ego. Because it is. Yeah. Yep. I like yeah. that word resistance. That's, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Yeah. And that's when, uh, when I'm feeling that way, um, I often have the um, line from one of the Star Trek movies where the Borg says, resistance is futile. <laughs> It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, you know, whenever I'm really willing and, um, well, just willing to, to let it go, to live my life through making one loving choice after another. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. Somebody else like to share? Penelope. I don't know if I didn't catch everything Leslie said, so excuse me if I repeat anything, because I'm not sure if I just missed a little bit of it. I just love these two section, these two bits, these two sections. I just thought they were just everything's in here for me. Um, I love the bit at the beginning where it actually says. The word within is unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. So I love the way it's saying that. It feels like that these two sections are a complete guide from Jesus. How to get there, how to be there. Um, the bit that I'm not sure if Leslie mentioned was, and I can't, I don't, I'm trying to see it in here. It, it's on one of the lines it's actually saying that the reason that we're these are my words that we're so attached to the ego is because we created the ego because we needed to create the ego so that we could create the sense of duality so that we could have the experience of what it was like to be separate so that is just a great reminder and it also at some point is and i don't know where it is because it's like i've got so much highlighted is the part where um that is the reason why we're so attached to the ego because we created the ego so this also reminds me of when jennifer in some of her classes has said the reason why we're so attached to these beliefs is we created them and because we created all the false beliefs because it's all part of the ego it comes back to that so it's just a real reinforcement so i just i just i love these two bits absolutely love them um and the other thing, and I just, I just love these words. I just find these words just so soothing. It's, it's in the section, this need not be. And it is literally those words where it says, when you are sad, no, this need not be. And that is just beautiful. And it, it's, it, it, it's so powerful in the sense that it's just the simple words, but the words are so powerful that literally this need not be. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Penelope. I know I, when I was reading those in that in the need not this need not be section, um, I highlighted so much in uh, paragraphs three, four, five. It just it felt like. You know, when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling guilty, I can command it. And it, it actually says uh, in um, paragraph four, 
uh, when you feel guilty, your ego is in command. So if I just say when I'm feeling guilty or when I'm feeling sad, with that kind of force, that commanding voice, this need not be. You know, that, that Gandalf in, in Lord of the Rings with his staff, you know, you shall not pass. It just feels like when I can say that and I can say it powerfully, that um, like I got goosebumps even just saying it now, <laughs> that it has so much power that I really can. It's like taking that pause, taking a moment and realizing, okay, I'm not in my right mind right now. And this need not be. I can get in my right mind with just those three, four words, four words, <laughs> just those four words. This need not be um, because it puts me in that state of the gap or the pause where I can say, okay, if this was how I am feeling, then what can I do differently? What can I think differently? How am I willing to see it differently so that I can know that absolutely this need not be? Linda, that was, that's so helpful to me because I just love Gandalf absolutely love Gandalf so actually to 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 say those words with that level of conviction as well oh that is just so helpful thank you for that you're welcome you're welcome and I know my mind often goes to movies or uh you know epic television shows or music pieces of music for the for the right words that have that uh that power for me so I also want to recognize um, Alex. Welcome. I don't think you've joined us before, so thank you for joining us. I just want to add one thing to that, too. That was in um, where you guys are talking about. It says, when your mood tells you that you have chosen wrongly, and this is whenever you're not feeling joy, so whenever your mood is telling you that you have chosen wrongly, then no, this need not be. Yes. So you're in a bad mood, don't know why, feeling a little melancholy. This need not be. I am choosing differently. Yeah. I am choosing joy in this moment. Yeah, yeah. very powerful. And the cool thing about that too is just in saying those words, like I don't have to try and figure out why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling or justify the way I'm feeling or um, you know, put a story behind why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. I can just say that and, and you know, think about what are the things that would feel um, self-nurturing, self-loving in this moment. And, you know, have, it, have a glass of water, do some deep breathing, um, go for a walk or just sit outside or whatever you can do whatever I can do to get my mind out of that space of where I'm feeling like I just want to ruminate in my pain, you know, like sitting in a mud puddle, like a little kid, just flailing my arms until the mud's covering my entire body. Would anybody else like to share anything about our reading this week or anything else that's going on in their world well i also highlighted um in section three that um that little prayer uh right after the first paragraph the kingdom is perfectly united and perfectly protected and the ego will not prevail against it. Amen. Um, and when I read that, in my mind, the word not was all capitalized and bold. <laughs> you know, again, it's that this need not be kind of power behind it. The ego will not prevail against it. 
the idea that comes to my mind, and I don't have my book in front of me, I just read it this morning, it's talking about how, you know, we're all part of this sonship, getting to that next stage or the, I guess the awakening you'd call it. Yes. And we all have our part to play in that. Yes. Even though we don't always see it. Exactly, Deborah. <laughs> we often don't see it, Linda. <laughs> That's my experience. I was trying to give us the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know when we can remember that, it feels like, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a two on the Enneagrams and have that, the helper um, personality, but I can motivate myself more by knowing that the work that I'm doing, this healing work that I'm doing, even though it can feel so challenging at times, that it's going to benefit so many other people. Like I just had um, uh, my friend, Lori Gifford, um, who's a spiritual counselor. She was doing a counseling session with one of her clients and um, her client has a brother that has uh, some kind of debilitating disease and um, he had come to visit her and she was complaining about um, his wife and some of the things he had been telling her about his wife and um, what she was doing or not doing for him or whatever. And she, Lori told her the story about what I'm going through right now with stepping away from my mom's care and, um, you know, how I had been caring for Rudy for all those years. And so, you know, I was just in a, in a place of burnout and she said to her, you know, your sister-in-law could probably use some support because she is caretaking him every day, all day long. And she could probably really use some support and a break from that. And her client was able to change her mind about how she was feeling about her sister-in-law and what her brother had told her with compassion, you know, to look at her with compassion and I thought, you know, that alone makes this whole crappy pile of goo that I'm dealing with feel worth it because my experience is helping another beautiful human being on this planet. And that just makes all the difference in the world. So that is why I continue to do this work even when things seem like, oh God, I just don't want to anymore, you know? So, yeah. We are healing each other. Our brothers and sisters are our salvation. Anything else? I'll, I'll try to remember that. That might be helpful to me because so many days I just hit this wall and I just don't want to go forward anymore with this whole process of healing and you know, pushing and struggling and everything it requires every single minute of every day. Yes. Yeah. Cause it feels relentless. It is relentless. Yeah. But God pursues us just as relentlessly. So that's when it's good when you reach out to me or anybody else that can remind you of who you really are. Deborah. Yeah, and I really appreciate that too. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm happy to do it. Your healing is my healing, sister. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have anything to share about the reading or anything else? Go ahead, Penelope. I'm sorry, I'm not really good at pointing out where things are today, but there is a line in here, again, that reminds us that when we think something is hard, it's because we believe that we are on our, we are alone. And, and I just think just that one line is another beautiful reminder that we're not alone and that we just have to ask. And I don't know if this helps, Deborah, but even asking spirit to take that belief and sense of struggle away. Yeah, thank you. I do that every day. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. 
Um, and the other thing I just wanted to share was it just reminded me, Linda, that when you were just talking about what happened in that session with Laurie, and I just, you know, it's just such um, a great example that, you know, you help many people and that's just, that's another example and how that shift can make the difference for that person. And I remember it's, it's quite a lot of years ago now that I'm, I'm going to talk, you know, that this, this event occurred for me. Um, and it was during the time when I couldn't work when I've been diagnosed with the PTSD. And one of the local papers um, had a section within their paper that was based on health issues. And so I agreed to do a, an interview um, on what I'd been through, given that it was 15 years before I was diagnosed with PTSD. And I had, in, the, in this country at that time, in the UK, there was only two specialists, one of which was in the south, in, Lon in the London area, and one which was at, there was another person who was actually in, not far from where I live, and what was great about this particular specialist was he also had experience of people that had been left with PTSD um, and had worked with many, many people that had been involved in the conflict in Ireland. And he actually agreed to see me for free and his fees were high an hour and he actually agreed to see me for free. And so when I um, did this interview for this newspaper, um, Sometime later, it was quite, quite a few weeks afterwards, I got a letter from somebody that had read this article um, and the page, she'd sent the letter via the paper and it'd been sent on to me. And this, this woman had written to me and she'd been in um, an incident again while working for a bank and was suffering greatly and her marriage had broken down as a result of it. And I was able to suggest the same people that had assisted me. And so out of that one article, it was one person. And one of the things when you were speaking that I realized was, yes, that was one person. One person then goes on to help somebody else. So it's the knock-on effect, which I think is so beautiful. Um, so yeah, it's like I can think, and probably many of us might think, that we're not actually really making a difference. And we just don't know. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Penelope, you have no idea how many other people were helped by that as well that didn't write to you, you know, or that uh, reached out for assistance somewhere, somewhere else, or that may have been feeling um, like giving up and that gave them some hope. We have no idea how we're touching other people's lives. So, um, intimately, you know, even if we don't know them, we can be touching other people's lives just by being who we are and sharing our experiences and, um, you know, being willing to do this uh, often challenging healing work within ourselves. Um, you know, other people can see who we are being through it. And I think it makes a huge difference. Um, and I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to have these experiences I'm so grateful and um, <laughs> but I get to share them um, even experiences that have happened decades ago that I can share them with people when spirit uh, nudges me to and lift others with m my own challenges that I have been through. It's so rewarding to watch somebody's light turn on, you know, you can just kind of see it in their face. And um, 
or you can hear it in their in their voice if you know if you're not with them face to face it's it's just so it's like the reason why we're here is to lift each other up and be a loving presence in the world right <laughs> yeah I just love when you're, when I make my intention to be truly loving, how opportunities just come up to be, just to do something nice. A little fun example, just yesterday, we have a little 4-H fair that's a mile from our house and they have carnival rides. And you know, it's, it's a fair. Well, because we live a mile from there, we get a free parking pass. So we save $10 just so we don't have to pay for parking when we go there. And I posted something on Facebook and, and, I just thought, it just came to me, I wonder if my friend Erin, because I know she has three kids, wanted to go, and I just said, hey, Erin, if you're going to the park, to the fair, uh, if you want to use my free parking pass, you're more than welcome to, and she, she wrote me back, she's like, oh my gosh, I'm going tomorrow, that'd be perfect, thank you so much, and it was just a little thing that, it just, it's like, when I originally, because I, I think I Facebook something about the pig I saw, or something, I can't even really remember, but it was just funny, <coughs> It, it just, it just worked out effortlessly, the whole thing. And I just, it's like when, when you're in love, those opportunities come up more and more. And I think that's, it makes, it makes, I was talking to my prayer partner, I said, I'm like, is that life getting exciting? It's getting more and more fun to see how is God going to work this out? <laughs> you know, it's instead of just being afraid, it's just more exciting, more meet and you can always ask the angels for help and you're never alone and how what's going to come up that i'm able to help somebody today or i really i i love that saint francis prayer as far as and for the longest time i didn't get it i just didn't get that prayer and i feel like i get it now it's like to, i can't think of it exactly but you guys all know what i mean it's instead of to to get love give love and it makes so much sense to me. So it was fun. So I, I'm sure they're all having a wonderful time today. Yeah, you certainly are an instrument of peace, Leslie, and love, uh -huh. for sure. Thank you. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. It is. It is. <laughs> Mindy, did you want to share? Yeah, I, I apologize for coming in a little late and I was sort of catching up and eating lunch so I didn't come in visible for a while, but um, I do love this section. One of my favorite sentences though that helps me because I can use this to beat myself up too. You know, it's like, okay, you know, you're feeling shitty and you know you don't have to feel shitty. So you should just get that done and start feeling better. So snap, snap, do it. And it's, <clears throat> You know, and that's just another ego play, right? It's, it's, I'm feeling bad. I shouldn't, you know, and, and, and it's not that. And it's funny, it's funny how they say in this book, some really thing that, that just really helped me. They call it um, uh, in the, the sixth uh, paragraph, it says, when you've given up this voluntary dispiriting. And I'm thinking, what a great way to phrase that. It's your voluntary dispiriting. You're voluntarily putting yourself down as opposed to doing something else. It's a voluntary misery that you get to have here. If you would like to volunteer for misery, just go ahead. And, that, and, and for some reason, that doesn't feel as bad as other things. Like I think other, other ways I've tried to get out of this as well, other people are worse off than you. That does not make me feel better. You know, or they're, they're, they're starving children in Africa and there's people who have worse financial problems than you or, you know, and all that crap, somebody who's sicker than you, somebody who's more hurt than you, more, so it has more drama than you. And actually all that does is reinforce this world I see and how horrible it is. It doesn't actually do anything. And I used to think that, that sort of the cynical grump view of the world was a way to stay safe was a way to, and you get all kinds of perks for talking to your, oh man, it was so bad that I did blah, blah, blah. And, and the, res the correct response to that as a friend in the world is to say, man, I don't know how you're doing it. Wow. 
you know, you are just making that happen, aren't you? You're just slugging through it. You're just a champ. And that isn't the answer. That actually is really almost the antithesis of what that person needs and what you need as a, as a participant in that energy right there. And, I, and that's a voluntary dispiritment. You know, that, that is, that is gra- you know, and it, it need not be, I don't often feel like Gandalf, but, um, but if I can find out and say, oh, <laughs> I'm volunteering to participate in this misery, I don't have to do that. There's plenty of other stuff I can do. I have a bird feeder to fill. I have dishes to do. I have something, you know, I have a closet to clean. I mean, I, there's got to, there's something else I can be spending my time on without that and without beating myself up for having those thoughts. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like changing the channel on your remote. It's like, whoops, don't like that show. Um, and I, I don't know if, I don't know. To me, the trick, it, and it does seem relentless, but it says, this is what it says. It says, when, you, uh, when you've given up this voluntary dispiriting, you will see how your mind can focus and rise above fatigue and heal. And that's when I, when I feel like it's relentless and I feel like it's 24 seven, cause it is, it really is that whole idea of, okay, well, yeah. Okay. So it is 24 seven just cause I'm a thinking being 24 seven and I don't have to hang here. Well, I saw it there. I took, I'm taking yoga and it hurts like a motherfucker. So, <laughs> right. I am sore. I am not really limber. It is not, you know, and they're telling me, Oh, well, just, just notice the feeling and let it pass. Okay, well, that is, that's the, that's the, that's the physical equivalent of what they're asking me to do. <laughs> and you know what? I'm going with it. And it, it, it's getting easier. <laughs> I am, I, I should have, I should have done this a little bit ago. Judge, judge, judge. But I, uh, anyway, that's where I'm at. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love that, Mindy. I know it's it's funny because um, my dance teacher is also a Kundalini yoga instructor, and so she has been to Kripalu several times for trainings and stuff. And she talks about like her ego the whole time she's on her way there is like, oh my god, I have to go here and see all of these granola eating, Lululemon wearing yoga assholes that are. <laughs> you know, just going to be like, oh, just go with the flow. And she's like, you know what? This is a mudra. <laughs> and we can do this mudra. <laughs> but she says, you know, once she gets in there, she finds her tribe, the people that are, that are not like, oh, love and light to everybody, you know, that are really authentically interested in uh, doing yoga as a spiritual practice and not just an exercise routine. And um, you know, an excuse to wear $300 tights, you know? <laughs> so I'm so glad you're doing that. <laughs> and I find with my own um, movement practice that I am really not flexible in most places in my body. I feel like that's kind of just how my body is. But I know when I was a kid, I used to be able to do like cartwheels and round offs and all of that stuff. So at one time, my body was very flexible. And I feel like there's a definite correlation to the amount of judgments that I have placed on my body that have caused it to become stiff and rigid and like concrete. And when I'm going into my movement practice, uh, as though it is part of my spiritual practice and taking my uh, judgments into that practice, whatever is in my mind at the time and with the intention of working on that while I'm moving, I do feel shifts in my mind afterwards that, um, you know, and I know there's that whole dopamine uh, kind of kick in from doing exercise of any kind, but um, 
I don't know. I feel like it's almost like when you're doing an exercise that's specifically for a certain muscle. Like when I go into that movement work with a certain intention in mind to heal a, a judgmental thought of myself or somebody else, that I'm building that muscle or flexing that muscle to release whatever judgment that I brought into the practice with me. You know what I find interesting is, because I love yoga and I'm extremely flexible, and yet as a kid, I could never do cartwheels, I could never do the splits, nothing like that, but I am very flexible now. Um, and I think it's interesting that I, I heard judgment that you guys were saying about the people, the light and the love, and I just thought, you know what? I do not judge, I seriously don't judge other people because our, my teacher really encourages us to close our eyes. So that's, I listen to my teacher, I'm a good student, I close my eyes and I really don't judge people. And now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I never occurred to me that people were judging me. And now I'm like, maybe people were judging me, but you spot it, you got it. And I didn't spot that, so I don't got it, right? <laughs> I mean, Yay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, to me, yoga is just, and I totally laughed, Mindy, when what you were saying, because it is funny, and everybody is so different, and it depends on your mood for sure if you go in there, and sometimes people can just be a little too chipper, and I, I'm one of those people. I know it. <laughs> I can be that way, you know? Um, but the other thing, this is a little off topic. I just, you just reminded me, Mindy, is we have Jehovah's Witnesses that come to our house quite often. It's because my husband loves to talk to them. <laughs> I like head for the basement. Scott runs to the door, you know, and he just loves to talk to them. And they are, they are such doom and gloomers as he calls it. And he'll be like, they'll be like, don't you think the world is basically going to hell? How, don't you think? And they will name all these negative things. And he'll just be like, no, that's not my experience. I think this is a fantastic world. We live in a free country. And I mean, he just, it amazes me because he, he's never going to change their mind and, and they're never going to change his mind. But it's just so interesting to me that he doesn't let their negativity affect him. And he's not in A Course in Miracles or anything, but I know he's my greatest teacher. And I think he came in this world knowing a lot of things. Again, I know I've mentioned not on the road when he's a complete, you know what, but judging other drivers. But um, again, I never see bad drivers. And it's just, I don't have any road rage. I just, it is so funny to me when I'm in the car with him. I'm like, well, sweetheart, you are attracting those bad drivers because I don't attract the bad drivers in front of me. You know, occasionally I'll be behind somebody that's slow or, you know, I just make it a game of, oh my gosh, they must be so, you know, I just find something positive to think about it, but. Um, I have no idea what my point is about all this, but I just wanted to share that about the Jehovah's Witness and Scott because I have to apologize to them um, the next time they come because I was very rude to them. It was Father's Day and they came in the drive-in and it was at my house, so I was stressed out anyway to have a Father's Day at my house because I'm not a good hoster. Or, I shouldn't say that. I don't prefer to be the hostess. And I was hosting and they were in the driveway and everybody was about to get there and I'm like, you guys need to leave right now. I mean, that was really kind of mean. And they're like, oh, okay, you know, and they left. And I feel bad because I was close hearted and I could have been much more loving when I told them to leave. But anyway, um, that's interesting about yoga. You guys keep at it. It's very good practice. And you're right, you just have to hold the pose, you know, however the pose looks like for you. Yeah, and it's an opportunity. For me, it's an opportunity to let go of those those judgments because there, I mean, I know that in this world that there exists yoga people or any people who are not authentic in whatever practice they're doing, but that's not most of them. Not only that, but how can you possibly know that? You know, it's a great opportunity to know your two bits and to do your whole pono pono. Yes. No, yep. no one can possibly know what's in somebody else's mind. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But I do hear what you're saying too. Yeah. My teacher always says, keep your eyes on your own damn mat. <laughs> exactly. You know, when I'm looking around and I'm seeing other people, what they're doing, and I'm either judging them or I'm judging myself, just keep your eyes on your own damn mat. <laughs> yeah. And see, that makes me feel a little sad because I just think yoga poses, they're just so beautiful. 
they, they can just be so beautiful, you know, and, and just because I can't do a headstand doesn't mean I don't still think that they're beautiful and I am happy that somebody else can do them, you know, but I've, I've really had to, I've come a long way with not judging my body too. So it's practice. And I think it's great that you, you know, yoga might be a trigger that you know that will, the judger is going to come with you to your yoga mat and you can leave them at the door, <laughs> you know, and just notice. I think that's exciting. Woo, I get to go to yoga today. Let's see if, if I judge anybody or myself. I'm going to make it my intention to be loving to myself and others today. How helpful is that? That's great, Leslie, because I, I actually don't feel, I'm in a, in a, a very comfortable studio, so I'm not seeing what I, what I know what you're talking about. But I, I, what the biggest, the biggest thing goes on between my head where, you know, I'm sitting on my, my thing and I hurt because I, ha you know, and then the story starts, right? I've had shoulder surgery. I have arthritis in my back. I have, I have, I have, I have. And of course I can't do that. And instead of, wow, okay, you know, let's, I, that's voluntary dispiriting right there. And I can maybe sit through this. Let's see if I can, you know, that hurts, but you know, it doesn't feel as bad as it did. You know, okay. What is it? What, what are we focused on instead of, and, and today, you know, and I've also decided that when my arms say not one more circle, I stop, you know, I just stop, you know, or not one more leg lift or one, one more breath of fire. Cause I'm dizzy. I'm, you know what? It's ikshne on that, but I, but at the same time, it's okay. It's, but, but my, my um, practice right now has to be to kind of clean up what's going on between my ears because it is, it, it, it gets wild and woolly in there and it makes me unhappy. It makes me really, and probably really horrible to be around. So, you know, I'm just, I, I could be the giant sucking sound of despair in my life or I can be joyful, you know, and I think maybe that's kind of an easy choice. So, I mean, to me, to me, that whole practice is about um, not hearing the story, not thinking through the story, staying in the moment, breathing through the thing, even if it seems like a minute is like three hours worth of some kind of activity that they're doing that Kundalini stuff, man. And, um, but that's exactly what I need today. So that's where I'm at. You know what, Mindy, that is called self-love. When oh, you yeah. can't do one more arm circle, good for you. That's taking care of yourself. That's, that's a good job. And I'm trying to be lighthearted about it. It's like, you know, I did five more than I did last time. So, you know, we're good. <laughs> Moving. <laughs> and even if you just sat there and breathed. That would be and perfect. That's what I did. I, I, I'm glad you're saying that. Well, and I also think it, it is beautiful. And I love, I love the fact that they have the meditations and everything else going on. So it's almost like, because I've always had some kind of story about exercise because I'm not one of those people. And um, <laughs> it's been really nice for me to say, you know, this is, it, it, it engages my head first. And it fools my body into doing something. So it's like, it's like, oh yeah, well this is this is that spiritual stuff we're doing, right? Okay. It's not really exercise. It's not really, you know, like those people, you know. So anyway, it's just it's it's been fun. My husband's been going with me, and it's been oh, a, that's fun. It's been a blast. So, and I thought he would get the giggles like you get in church sometimes because you know we don't know Sanskrit and we don't chant. So um, it was really, <laughs> and I'm the one who gets giggles. So. It's been a, it's been a real joy. So it, if I, uh, and, and very, very instructive, I think. Oh, I'm so happy for you both. That's yeah. awesome. It's a lot of fun. Very cool. Yep. When you're giggling, you're bringing the joy into the studio. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I was going to bring us back into, um, this need not be. So I highlighted in um, the very first paragraph, uh, like the beginning part of the middle and the end. 
where he says, um, if you cannot hear the voice for God, it is because you do not choose to listen. That you do listen to the voice of your ego is demonstrated by your attitudes, your feelings, and your behavior. And then when he says, a little further down, your mind is filled with schemes to save the face of your ego, and you do not seek the face of Christ. And the last sentence, how can it maintain the trick of its existence except with mirrors? And for me, the mirrors are everybody around me. So whatever I am seeing in my brothers and sisters are my own judgments. Um, and that feels helpful because sometimes when I'm feeling, however I'm feeling, I'm not even realizing it because I'm, I was so used to, uh, in my younger years, like denying how I felt, denying my feelings, stuffing down my feelings. And, um, so now I can look at it as an opportunity when I'm seeing sadness or guilt or anger or um, whatever I'm seeing in somebody else, I can look at that as that mirror and say, okay, where is this within me? And how can I heal that? Um, and that just feels helpful. Again, another demonstration of our brothers and sisters are our salvation. We were talking in our mastery circle about um, relationships this past weekend. And, uh, it, you know, everybody's got a relationship they want to offer up that to change from a special to a holy relationship. And What's been striking to me in my process as I've looked at that is how the special relationship that I am so interested in giving up is often the thing I need most to learn. Like the person that is the most challenging to me, um, the one I offered up in, in class is a friend of mine who has really kind of hit bottom in her life and she cannot see right now uh, a different way. And she doesn't want to hear anything about spirituality because she's forgotten more about a spiritual path than I know. I mean, she, that has been her life. She has been involved in everything and she's lost faith in a lot of ways. At least that's what it seems to me. And one of the things that she asked in this conversation that we had was she asked me to recount the, the areas that I had screwed up because she was feeling like a screw up and she just wanted some fellowship in that and I, I and nothing else was working I'm like okay well I'm just going to answer her because that's what she's saying so I let her have it with all the stuff that I really feel like I whooped up on and, and she's been there through a lot of it so I'm not sure it was just it was my greatest hits right so um but what I found is that I don't really have the attachment to those stories anymore and so in that conversation with her she in in her need and i was thinking i'm not helping her at all i have no idea what my witness is supposed to be here at all I, I mean obviously it's not to give counsel about spiritual stuff she doesn't want to have it not my place to force it so and all i could think of is hey man that doesn't have that icky crappy feeling it always had I, i'm not judging myself on this i'm not and i was able to rattle it off and say yeah and i learned this and i learned that and i learned this and i learned that and, and it was like, so when I, when she left, I have no idea how, if she felt better, she said she did, but I, I mean, I don't know, didn't, it, 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 but, but I did, I was like, oh, okay, so there has been healing here. How about that? Well, thank you, Anne. That was pretty awesome. It's come by again, you know, and, and, and that's a different, that's a different feeling than I've had before because I've, I've, when it talks about saving the face of your ego, my ego has gotten down with the idea of being a rescuer and a swoop in and fix things and make it happen and blah, blah, blah. And, and, um, and it was really nice to, to kind of revel in the whoopsies of my life and, and be able to celebrate them as, as not fatal. 
you know, and not really all that important, to be honest. Um, and when it says that, you know, the Holy Spirit will right all wrong decisions if you let them, I was like, all of a sudden, I'm like, this, all these wrong decisions are now helping Anne. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And it was, it was really cool, but yeah, I, I, anyway, so I, I was struck. I was struck by that when a lady in our, our thing was talking about being an over giver, like always giving. And the person that she was most needing to transform was someone who was being taken advantage of someone who was being taken advantage by someone who was consistently always asking for money. So she was in a relationship you know, so her special friend was somebody who was in a exploitive relationship. And I'm thinking, well, here's a mirror. Hello, here we are. You know, this is what exploitation looks like. You know, this is how it feels. And now you have a good chance to look at it. And um, what, what an amazing lesson. Amazing. So. Yeah, that's awesome, Mindy. Thank you for that. Yeah, I've kind of used that same, uh, you know, going through my greatest hits, as you called it. I love that. <laughs> I made a list on little post-it notes um, sometime before I actually got the nerve to make that decision that I was going to step away from the caregiving thing. And I wrote down all of the traumatic experiences that I've had in my life that I have survived and overcome. And I don't know, there's got to be, there's like 12 or so of them. And above it, I wrote, why I am a spiritual badass superhero. <laughs> and so anytime I was feeling like, Oh, I don't know if I could do this. I really don't know if I could do this. I would go have it on the bathroom, uh, inside my bathroom closet door and open up the door and I would read those things. And I'm like, okay, yeah, right. Okay. I got it. I can, I can do this. I can do this. But it's so, it is so good sometimes to have the opportunity to look at those things and realize, uh, yeah, that just doesn't have the same stickiness that it used to. It, I don't feel um, really anything about them anymore. And that is such a wonderful place to be. Um, you know, I still recognize that they happened, but I don't feel like they happened to me, that I'm not a, I don't feel like I'm a victim to them anymore. And it's such a lovely, freeing space to be. You know, I haven't made a list like that, but I certainly could. And I'm really glad, thank you, Mindy, for your sharing. And too, Linda, I hadn't thought of it that I'm not attached to those things anymore, but that's such a good word because I'm not, I mean, I almost, it's almost like I'm not that person anymore. It's like, I don't even, I'm a completely different person now than I used to be. Thank you, God. You know, it's neat that you're continuing to grow and learn and, and not be attached to the, to our past. Cause I know some people die being attached to their past and I'm grateful. I'm not going to be one of them. Amen, sister. And I just want to paragraph 11, section one just says i understand that miracles are natural because they are expressions of love and i just love that whenever you're being an expression of love you're creating a miracle or god's creating a miracle for you i think that's neat yeah hi this is marjorie can you hear me hi marjorie yes hi yeah, I'm, I'm experiencing some difficulties in, in uh, family relationships right now and um, just wanting to ask a question about, is it possible to stay engaged in, in the relationship, in the daily activities or whatever, whatever it might be that's going on that might be dysfunctional or um, uh, not where I would like it to be? 
um, can I, in other words, do I have to make a choice between not engaging, walking away, um, or can I still stay involved, but do it from a different place in consciousness? And I'm just sort of playing with that because it, I get triggered, of course. And um, it's very easy to fall back into the dysfunction. But at the same time, um, I feel like if I just walk away, that's sort of almost like a, a stance of passive aggression. In other words, I'm not walking away because I really want to walk away. I'm walking away because I feel like, um, you know, I, I haven't yet learned how to stay engaged from a loving place, you know? So I, I, it's just sort of a little bit of, I guess it's a little bit of complexity there. Maybe I don't know, but I'm, I'm just wondering if anyone else has experience with the choice to um, stay in the relationship that, that is dysfunctional but to um, hopefully do so from a loving place and maybe that can help to make the difference because I feel like walking away is not an option for me right now and I, that's not, at least that's not my choice you know um, to just not engage so any any thoughts on that from anyone yeah Marjorie I'm I'm walking through this right now with my sister um, and what I can say has been very helpful for me is um, becoming really clear on what is it I would like um, and sticking to that. What is it I would like? So I know that um, in the past we have had my whole family has had dysfunctional relationships. And so I've gotten this clear, it almost feels like a commandment to step away from caregiving for my mother because it's not, it's not healthy for me anymore. It really physically is not healthy for me anymore. And, um, and so I've ex expressed that, that desire to my sister and, um, you know, also express that, you know, this is not probably a permanent thing that I'm looking at like six months to a year. I really just need to not have to deal with anything that has to do with that, you know, unless it's an emergency situation. And so because we have had this dysfunctional relationship all of our lives where I've been the one that would swoop in and fix things or make things easier for everybody else. There's a lot of pushback and um, it's not comfortable to have to have the conversations, but I'm, determined to stand in the truth that I know that this is the right decision for me and for my mother. Um, so when I got an email from my sister yesterday asking me, um, would I consider um, continuing to get mom's meals and meds on Sunday? Because that Saturday and Sunday are my sister's only days off and sometimes they travel to um, visit uh, her wife's family um, near Pittsburgh and they live in uh, Dunkirk, New York. And, um, you know, at first it was like getting a punch in the gut because it's like my sister is not seeing me, not seeing what's going on with me. And then it was like getting pissed off at her for even asking. And then I was able to see it with compassion 
knowing that she's just really scared about having to do this on her own, even though I told her I'm not completely abandoning her, <laughs> that, you know, if she really needs me, I would totally be there for her. Um, but at the same time, uh, no, I cannot do Sundays. Actually, Sundays are, are a horrible day for me to do the work because the work that I do with the ministry often is calling people um, that are participants of the ministry. A lot of them work Monday through Friday, and the majority of them don't live on the East Coast. So my weekend afternoons, a lot of time are spent on the phone talking to the people that I'm working with in the ministry or my own clients. Um, and so that's, that's what I uh, typed back to her. Uh, and I haven't heard back from her since. Mm -hmm. So I, f for me, it's still, you know, I'm praying about it and I'm sending her blessings and love and, uh, but it was very important for me to get super clear. What exactly is it that I would like? What is the deep desire of my heart in this relationship? And I'm going for a holy relationship with my sister. Um, and trying not to be attached to what that means, you know, even if it means that she doesn't want to see me or talk to me or deal with me for a while, mm -hmm. you know, it's heartbreaking because I love her so dearly. Um, she's three and a half years younger than me, but I, I am super clear on what it is, what my goal is. Right. Well, thank you. That That's very helpful. I, I, um, in, in my case, this is between my son and daughter-in-law and the grandchildren. Um, and I, I feel clear as to how I would like for things to be, but I'm also clear that that is not happening. And because it's not happening, uh, that's what is. So I'm trying to accept things as they are without trying to, to make it something that it, that it isn't yet, you know. Um, I feel like from my judgment or, or discern, I guess it would be my discernment is that what I would like to see happen is not possible at this particular point in time. The, the people involved, my son and daughter-in-law and the grandchildren, are not at that place where they can meet me where I am. So therefore I need to meet them where they are. Um, and that, that's where I'm running into difficulties because you know, there's a, there's a, a fine line between codependency, which I'm, pr I'm prone to, that's part of the dysfunction that I the, 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 the role that I took in the, in the dysfunctional family life in my original family growing up as a child was going into that um, mode of um, being the invisible one, uh, also of uh, being the peacemaker, you know, trying mm -hmm. to make everybody else happy and, and uh, trying to give everyone no reason to be, for me to be the problem, you know. Um, so I was the do-gooder, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I could very easily fall back into that, you know, which I, I don't want to do that. But at the same time, I also don't want to <clears throat> not be there because to, take, to pull myself out of the situation, first of all, I have to examine my motives and my intention for doing that. Because in a way that, that also is sort of like a passive-aggressive way of saying, oh, well, you know, I'll just take, like, take my toys and go home, you know, and um, so I, it's like I want to still be there, and mostly for the, for the sake of the grandchildren. They're ages 8, 12, and 18, so they're still, you know, they're not adults yet, um, so I don't, I don't know. That's where I'm just, uh, I, I do thank you for your feedback, and I, and I, if there's anyone else that has feedback, but I, I feel like I'm choosing to make, make the choice to actually stay in a situation that I know is dysfunctional to see if I can maintain my own sovereignty, you know, my own self. Um, 
and and sometimes I still get triggered. So sometimes I actually contribute to the dysfunction. Yeah. You know, but um, I I don't know. I I'm just uh, I think it's almost like an experiment at this point. Yeah. To just sort of try this and see how it works out. I can make another choice later if I need to. You know. Do you have a copy of the Divine Experiment? From the workbooks? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, I haven't it's looked at fantastic. <laughs> it's a fantastic exercise. And so what helps me, because I do the codependent thing too. That's my first, that's my first uh, mm -hmm. go-to thought. It's been really helpful me, for, for me to say, I don't know what's going to make me happy. And to let it, let all the outcomes go. I have no idea mm -hmm. what is, what truly is going to make me happy. So it, it opens me up to a whole different way of it working itself out. Thank you. I will take a look at that. I haven't looked at that in a while. Thank you. Good luck. That's, that's a tough place to be, but you're doing it. You're rocking it. <laughs> Thank you're doing you. It. Yep. That's just ask yourself in each and every moment, Marjorie, mm -hmm. is this the most loving choice? Is this mm -hmm. the loving choice for me and for everyone? in this moment. So anytime you have that, that trigger of this is dysfunctional, ask yourself, you know, what's the most loving choice right now? And the loving choice for you will be the most loving choice for everyone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I find it interesting that the unconditional love, it's like, that's, that's not, that's not a question. I mean, that's already there. We, we all know we love each other. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's really kind of cool too. So that that foundation is there. And it's really interesting that so many families, I, I would say most families are dysfunctional. <laughs> it's just yeah. a question of degree, probably. But um, it's funny how, how the unconditional love can be present and the dysfunction can continue to go on. So it's like that, that, um, that polarity you know like you like you have we all know we, we love each other but sometimes that love hurts and it could be very dysfunctional yeah you know so um i don't know well just know that we're we're holding you sweet sister and um praying for the highest and best for you and for your son and his wife and your grandchildren thank you so much you're welcome thank you well, I know we've yeah. gone over. Is there anything else that anybody else would like to share? See you, Mindy, before we go. Sorry. All right. Well, I was inspired by um, Leslie, so I think I'm going to close this out with the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow charity. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. All right, so... Um, for next week, um, I'd like to continue in chapter four. Um, so the ego body illusion and the rewards of God. So it's very short. Each section is um, only about a page and a quarter to a page and a half. So that's what we're going to be uh, focusing on next week. Healing these illusions. Thank you everybody for coming and sharing and <clears throat> love you all.
We'll see you next week. Thank you, Linda. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Love you all. Bye. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone.